Welcome back chemists. In our first lesson we looked at hybridization for carbon atoms. Today we're going to look at how we can build molecules and review some concepts of bonding that hopefully you learned a little bit about in your former chemistry classes, but we'll take it from scratch in this lesson. I want to start off by showing how the atoms we see in organic compounds are typically bonded when they have no formal charge. Hydrogen atoms will always make one single covalent bond in just about all the organic compounds we look at. Carbon will make four bonds, but having four single bonds is not the only way it can do it. You could also have a double bond and two single bonds. That's also four bonds. You could also have a triple bond and then only one single bond, or you could have two double bonds. So we'll see carbon atoms that look like all four of those in the compounds we look at. Nitrogen, another common element in organic species, uh, will have three bonds and one lone pair. Again, this is when you don't have a formal charge, and if you're thinking, I don't know what a formal charge is, that's okay, stick around for just a minute or two. We'll, we'll get there in just a moment. Uh, three single bonds is one way to do it. Alternatively, you could have one double bond and one single bond, or you could have just one triple bond. All of those have one lone pair, unshared pair of electrons on the nitrogen atom. Moving over to oxygen, we could have two bonds, two single bonds and two lone pairs, or you could have one double bond and two lone pairs. And the last one up there, that X, that's what we usually use to mean a halogen. So a chlorine, a fluorine, a bromine, an iodine, those will just make one bond and they'll have three lone pairs around them. Now, some of those heavier halogens can exceed the octet and we'll certainly see structures where they have hypervalent species, uh, but most of the time it looks kind of just like a hydrogen, singly bonded, attached to the rest of our molecule. So let's use that as a guide and predict what these molecules look like. These are skeletal structures. Without the bonding complete, we're missing lone pairs and we're missing the adequate number of bonds. First one is a formaldehyde molecule. The hydrogens are fine, but the carbon needs an extra bond. So I'm gonna put a carbon-oxygen double bond, and that actually takes care of the oxygen as well, except the oxygen also needs two lone pairs. There we go. Now, when you first learned how to draw structures, you counted the total valence electrons for a structure. Carbon brings four, oxygen brings six, and each hydrogen brings one. So that's 12 electrons, and that's exactly what we have. Two, four, six, eight, 10, and 12 for the formaldehyde molecule. But in organic chemistry, we're only dealing with a handful of elements. You kind of get used to just what the bonding pattern looks like. So I'm going to avoid going into counting valence electrons for this exercise. It's still a uh, valid way of figuring out a structure, uh, but we're going to take it a little more accelerated in this, in this lesson. The next one has two nitrogen atoms attached, but nitrogen makes three bonds. It can't bond to the hydrogens because hydrogen only makes one. So the nitrogens must be doubly bonded. And then there's a lone pair on each nitrogen. Next up, we have a, a bigger molecule. This looks like an amino acid. If you, or actually, no, I take that back. This is an amide. This is an amide, a functional group we'll learn about shortly. The carbon is good. It's already making four bonds. The nitrogen is good, except it needs a lone pair. This carbon here needs an extra bond. So we'll put a carbon oxygen double bond. That means the oxygen gets two lone pairs. And actually, the rest of that molecule is good. The carbon on the right is making four bonds. Now, this last one's the beginning of what's called a pyridine molecule, and all the carbon atoms and the nitrogen atom are incomplete in this skeleton. Each carbon needs four bonds. They're currently only making three. So how could I make carbon-carbon double bonds or possibly carbon-nitrogen double bonds? Well, I could put a carbon-carbon double bond right there on the left. I could put a carbon-carbon double bond in the lower right, and then a carbon-nitrogen double bond in the upper right, and then one lone pair on the nitrogen at the top. That satisfies that structure. Now, maybe you're following along, and you drew an alternative, so I have a backup right here, or instead you made the carbon-nitrogen double bond on the left of the molecule, and then the carbon-carbon double bond on the right, and then the lower left of the molecule. Is that still valid? Yes, that's what's called a resonance contributor. In this case, it just looks like the molecule's flipped around, but it also classifies as a resonance contributor, and it is a different representation of the same compound. We will come back to resonance later on, but maybe if you've heard of it before a little bit, there's a preview of some resonance contribution. So I said that this is the bonding pattern we see when you don't have formal charges. What's up with formal charges? Well, formal charges are what we assign to atoms and molecules. We pretend that the bonding that exists between two atoms is completely shared equally. And that means that some atoms look like they gave fewer electrons than they actually have to give based on their valence or that they gave more than they have based on their valence. This helps us keep track of electron density in molecules. And that is a great way to help predict how things react. Organic chemistry is all about how molecules react and designing new reactions and things that are electron rich 
will react with things that are electron poor and vice versa. And formal charges are one way that we can keep track of those electron densities. So this is just gonna show us how to calculate what it is when it's not a zero formal charge. The formula for a formal charge is based on comparing how many valence electrons an atom has compared to how many it looks like it's having in the bonded structure. Uh, mathematically, it's the valence of that atom minus how many bonds it's making minus how many unshared pairs of electrons or dots, uh, just electrons themselves individually. So VBD, valence minus bonds minus dots. So here we have the hydronium ion. You might remember that hydronium has an overall plus one charge, but we're not gonna put the square brackets and the plus charge in the upper right. We're gonna put that charge exactly where it is in the structure and see where it's localized. Hydrogen has a valence of one and it looks like it's contributing one electron, so it has no formal charge. It's the oxygen that has a formal charge here. The valence of oxygen is six. It's making three bonds, and it's only got two dots on it, so it looks like it's contributing only five electrons, hence it has a plus one formal charge. And we just put a plus, maybe with a circle around it, somewhere near the symbol for the element, upper right, upper left, something like that where it makes sense in the structure. Right next to it, this is called nitromethane. Uh, the carbon has a valence of four, it's making four bonds and it has no lone pairs of electrons. So this actually has no formal charge and we don't write zero formal charges. Uh, it's implied when there's no formal charge written. However, the oxygen down here, the oxygen has a valence of six. It's making one bond and it's got six lone pairs, uh, six electrons around it. So that's a negative one formal charge. So I'm put a little minus sign right next to the, the singly bonded oxygen. The doubly bonded oxygen also has a valence of six. It's making two bonds and four dots, so it has no formal charge, unlike the other oxygen down there, and I don't need to write anything. That just leaves the nitrogen in the middle. Nitrogen has a valence of five in group 15. It's making four bonds here and no lone pairs, so it has a plus one formal charge on the nitrogen. Oh, I wrote one down here, and I meant to write negative one for the oxygen. Uh, let's do the rest and actually not write out the arithmetic. This is something you do in your head and eventually you'll just recognize what they are. So here is what's called diazomethane. Uh, the hydrogens are good. The carbon I can tell is good. It's making four bonds. The nitrogen in the middle looks out of place. It's making four bonds. And up above, we saw that it makes three when it's got no formal charge. So a valence of five minus the four bonds minus no lone pairs of electrons gives us a plus formal charge the nitrogen in the middle. The one on the right has also a valence of five. It's making two bonds and four dots. So that's five minus two minus four. That actually has a negative formal charge. So notice this thing is overall neutral, but it still has charge separation within the molecule. And again, that's gonna help us predict how these things react. Lastly, we have uh, methyl ammonium chloride. The carbon is already good with four single bonds. The nitrogen, valence of five, minus four bonds, minus no lone pairs. That's a plus formal charge. The hydrogens are all good. Uh, the chlorine over there, that's a valence of seven. It's a halogen, minus no bonds, but minus eight unshared electron dots. That's a negative one charge. That should make sense. That's a chloride anion. That's Cl minus, the common anion that we should be familiar with for our halogens. Okay, so last up. There's another way we represent molecules in addition to drawing out their entire structural formula. This is called a condensed structural formula. And for the most part, it's a way you can simply type an organic structure and it gives you more information than just the molecular formula. The molecular formula is just how many of each type of atom you have in that compound. A condensed structural formula actually shows you a little bit of the bonding arrangement, and you can actually draw a structure from it for the most part. These are all linear molecules. We'll come back to this another time when we have to think about cyclic things, but for now, this just works for linear molecules with branches, but not confined to rings. <laughs> and eventually, we're gonna get to line structures very quickly, so we will uh, digress from this. But it's important to know how to read this. Chemistry is a language class, and we need to be literate in this communication as well. So how do I take a condensed structural formula and turn it into a structural formula? Well, let's count the carbons that we see in a series. There is one, two, three, four, and then even though there's two in parentheses, only one of them are gonna be in a straight chain. You'll see why. Notice that is a chlorine. That is not a carbon iodide. I know this is a sans serif font. Uh, chlorine would look like that, and capital I would look like that. You just have to recognize that's not a carbon iodide. It wouldn't make sense with the bonding. There'd be not enough bonds on that carbon atom. So it's not a carbon, that's a chlorine. 
you'll, you'll get it as you keep going. So I'm gonna draw five carbons in a row. One, two, three, four, and five. And then left to right, fill in what's attached. The first one on the left has three hydrogens. Yes, they're written right after the carbon, uh, but I know they must all be attached to that carbon atom. That also completes the bonding. The next carbon has one H and one chlorine, and they're coming off of the carbon as if they are branches, H and Cl, and there we go. Sometimes you might see a branch inside a pair of parentheses, sometimes not, it depends on if it's important or not, uh, but it's perfectly acceptable to put them in parentheses, so you'll see that as well. Uh, the next carbon has two hydrogens on it, so we have H and H, and then the next carbon only has one H on it, so what else is on this fourth carbon? Well, that fourth carbon is one, is this one, so what's attached to the fourth one, one of those two in the parentheses, and then a second one branched off. Now, I'm arbitrarily drawing this with a lot of right angles, and it's okay if you have them uh, above the chain instead of below, or below instead of above, that's that's interchangeable. Remember, we learned in our first lesson, you can rotate around sigma bonds uh, fairly freely uh, without too much energy. It's pi bonds we have to watch out for, and we'll get to that when we look at geometric isomerism. Let's try another one right below this. We have one, two, three. Ah, that's in a pair of parentheses, so it's probably a branch. So I'll say four and five carbons in a series. So one, two, three, four, and five. The first carbon off to the left has three hydrogens on it. So one, two, and three. The second carbon has two H's, so H and H. The third one has an H and a CH3, what's called a methyl, so I'll write H and CH3, just condensing it to save space. The next carbon has two H's. And then the last carbon apparently has an H and an O attached to that carbon. And hopefully it doesn't make any sense to do that. That does not complete the bonding on the carbon, that doesn't complete the bonding on the oxygen, and it also violates the bonding of the hydrogen. So that can't possibly be it. What do we have instead? Well, we have one hydrogen on that carbon, and then the oxygen is also bonded to the same carbon, and as we had to do up above, we have to complete the bonding. So there's a double bond on that carbon and two lone pairs on that oxygen. Uh, just a sneak preview, that's called an aldehyde functional group. We'll learn functional groups later, but now you can recognize, oh, a CHO is an aldehyde group. So I'd like you to hit pause and try the remaining two, and then even try the third one. Can you turn that structural formula into a condensed structural formula, and then come back and see how you did. Okay, let's take a look. So the, the next one has, there's two carbons in parentheses. I'm gonna count one of them as part of the series. That's two, that's three, and that's four. So only four carbons in a row. One, two, three, and four. Uh, that first one is one of two off of the next one in. So that means there's another CH3 off of that carbon, and the first one had just three hydrogens. The next one also has an H on it, and then we get to a CH2, another CH2, and then an O, and an H. Notice how different just writing CHO versus OH ends up becoming in your structure in the end, but the bonding that we have to have helps us make sense of it. And then the last one in, in this form we have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five carbons. Now, if I just draw five carbons separated by an oxygen, one, two, and then oxygen, three, four, five, I can tell already I'm not gonna have the right hydrogen count. If I start to fill in my hydrogens, I'm not gonna have enough on this carbon right here. So this can't be our structure. So this oxygen must actually be branched off of that second carbon. So we actually have five carbons in a row, one, two, three, four, and five, and the second one has an oxygen branch, and that must be its double bond with two lone pairs. That means the first carbon has three hydrogens on it, and then the rest of the carbons are simply filled in with hydrogens. I'm going to move this over here just to make some space, because it's getting crowded. 
very soon we will learn how to draw what are called line structures and if you are already doing that I would say good for you because we're going to use that the rest of this class but we do need to know how to communicate in other ways as well it's important to learn multiple dialects in the organic chemistry language if we will last up we have a structural formula that we want to turn into a condensed structural formula so left to right I have a CH3, CH2, CH2, so I'll start with that, CH3, CH2, CH2, and then we have a carbon with two oxygens and a CH3, so you can simply write carbon, two oxygens, and CH3, and that's a perfectly valid condensed structure formula. If instead you wrote COOCH3, that is also acceptable. No difference. In fact, you'll see both. Okay, so to recap, this is how we turn condensed structural formulas into structural formulas and vice versa. Uh, we looked at some typical bonding patterns that we see in molecules without a formal charge. And then perhaps the newest thing that you'll have to get used to pretty quickly is the common formal charges.